Shalom, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the Mormon Kabbalah Podcast. This week we're on chapter 32 in the Book of Remembrance, and this is going to be a little different. This revelation is on the nature of God, but it's not like a lot of theological treatises that you might find or read where people take scriptures and say, and because of this, we can define God this way. Instead, I feel like this chapter introduces us to different aspects of God without actually defining God. And so when I received this revelation, it was a little confusing because I thought, that we would get something that we as finite beings could use and understand. And I think that we did. At the same time, though, how do you definitively define the infinite? I, I don't think that's possible. And so as I go through this chapter, I want listeners to understand, and, and readers, hopefully you're, you're going to read this chapter at some point, I want you to understand that this revelation wasn't given to put God in a box or to trap God in a box, but to help us see from a variety of different viewpoints. And so I want to describe this chapter like this. Imagine that you have a picture of a tree. Let's say that it's a drawing and it was drawn by a child. So maybe you have a fat stick with something that looks a bit like a bush at the top or maybe some branches sticking out. But it's it's pretty poor quality and it is just two-dimensional. Now compare that to a picture of a tree by a fine artist. Now all of a sudden you have all these details, but it's still two-dimensional. Well, now you've got a photograph of a tree and that photograph is going to pick up literally everything. There's details that an artist can forget about, or, or leave out, but in a photograph, everything is captured. But a photograph's really an illusion. And again, it's it's only 2D. So we, so we still have these imperfect views of God. So now someone decides to make a 3D model. Think those Pixar movies. And now we have this three-dimensional shape that we can walk around and look at. And that's really, really good. But again, it's art. Now imagine you're taken to the forest or you, you drive the forest or walk to the forest yourself and you're there. You can touch the tree. You can feel the tree. You can walk around the tree. With each of these, you'll notice that line upon line, precept upon precept, you're going to learn more about trees. But even when you're there in the forest, you can see the, the leaves blowing in the wind. You can hear them moving and rustling. You can see nature interacting with the trees, maybe birds or squirrels or ants, or other insects, other animals in the tree. But to know how old a tree is, you have to cut it down and count the rings. In order to taste its sap, there has to either be a hole drilled into it, or you have to make a hole. And so even when you're there standing next to a tree, you can't know everything about it. So when we're studying God as finite beings, we are trying to stare into the infinite and understand it. And I think that that is possible on an individual and even some ways a collective level to where each of us has our own understandings and we can learn from each other. But until we become infinite beings again, as finite beings, we can only express certain aspects. And so because of that, it may be a 2D childlike drawing. It may be a drawing like a fine artist. And maybe you're talking to someone who has literally been in the forest and seen the trees, has stood next to the Lord, like, like Paul. But at the end of the day, even Joseph Smith didn't fully understand the nature of the Godhead, and his idea of the nature of God grew and changed throughout his lifetime. When the Church of Jesus Christ was first organized, they were Trinitarians. When they dropped that church and started a new church in 1835, the Church of Latter-day Saints, it became two gods, the Father that was a spirit and the Son, which had a physical being, and the Holy Spirit was their combined minds, according to the lectures on faith. 
And by the time he died, we know he had a vision of Heavenly Mother. He saw our Heavenly Parents as beings with physical bodies, flesh and bone, but no blood. The same with the Son. And the Holy Ghost was its own entity now, a being of spirit, not yet resurrected. And then Brigham Young and his sect grew that in one direction. James Strang grew that in another. Sidney Rigdon grew it in another. And all the other people are starting new churches. They just took these ideas and they just kept growing with them. And are their ideas wrong? I think that each of them hold a kernel of truth. And I think that we can learn from all of them as we grow line upon line and precept upon precept. So I want you to understand, I said all of that, I'm talking for what, five minutes or so now? Because before I get into this chapter, I want you to understand that what I'm sharing with you today are my thoughts on the nature of God as described in this revelation. And I want you to know that if you have different thoughts, that's okay. And in fact, we might both be right. We might both be wrong. What matters to the Lord is that we're taking the time to get to know him. So I want to thank you today for taking the time to listen to this podcast, to read this chapter in the Book of Remembrance, and to allow me to share my thoughts in this moment on the nature of God with you. Because I guarantee you that five years from now, if I remake this podcast, it probably won't be exactly the same. Because I'm hoping that as a finite being, I will have learned, grown, and gotten to know the Lord better within that time frame. So let's get into verse one here. And I say unto thee, my servant David, and what I say unto thee, I say unto all Israel, upon the tree of life rests 10 sephirot, and unto these the earth, Eden, is sealed. So a couple of things here I want to discuss, and I feel weird being the person to discuss the first part. This is a revelation that I received. I am David. And there are times when I receive revelations that are for me. There are times I receive revelation that are for my family. There are times I receive revelation for the fellowship. There are times I receive revelation for people that have come to me that aren't a part of the fellowship seeking light and knowledge, and they ask me to receive a revelation for them. There have been a couple of times when I have received revelation for all of the Latter-day Saints. This revelation, and by that I mean the Book of Remembrance, I believe belongs to the whole world, anyone that's seeking God. I don't think that this book was given to me from the Lord to create a church or to create any kind of divisions, but rather to bring people together. And that's why it says Israel and not merely the fellowship or the saints or anything like that. This is a universal book like the Bible and Book of Mormon, that just belongs to everyone. Yasharel, straight to God. And so what the Lord is saying here is that everyone should know, the Lord wants everyone to know that there is a tree of life. And on that tree of life are 10 sephirot, and that there is a connection, a sealing power connecting these 10 sephirot on this and this tree of life to the earth. And I believe that the name of the earth based on this is actually Eden. So when Genesis says that there was a garden in Eden, I don't think that means that there was a country or a continent called Eden. I I think that there was a garden on the earth, and that's Eden. Now, seeing that Adam and Eve had to leave Eden, whether that's a spiritual idea of the earth or the literal idea of the earth, I don't know. It may be both. It may go back and forth. But I think this verse says quite a bit here because it's talking about this tree of life, these 10 sephirot, actually says sephiroth, and the earth that is Eden. And then in verse 2, it says, and what are the sephirot? These are the divine attributes of mankind calling down from the heavens, declaring the glory of God. Now in Jewish Kabbalah, the 10 sephirot are what created everything. They were created first in in the first chapter of Genesis. And they are that Elohim that creates the creation in chapter one of Genesis. But this says that these are the divine attributes of us. And so 
again, I don't think that one is correct and the other is wrong. I think that they're both right because we were made in the image of God. Therefore, just as the Sephirot would be divine attributes of our God, because we're made in God's image, they would also be divine attributes within us. And they are calling down from the heavens, declaring the glory of God. So as we get to know the Lord better, we get to know ourselves better as we're able to see our own divine attributes because we were created by the Lord. And in verse three, it says, and they are three from before the creation. They are seven from the days of creation. So out of the 10, this sounds to me like it's saying that three of them deal with the pre-mortal world. We'll say it like that. And then the other seven deal with the creation itself. Then in verse four, it says, even as mankind climbs up the tree towards God, they are in sin. But through me, Jesus, who is the Christ, they climb down, bringing the heavens to the earth. And in this, there is salvation. So we're saved in Christ. I, I think every Christian already knows that. We're perfected in Christ. I, I hope that every Christian already knows that. But it sounds like we are climbing up and down. We are moving around in this tree. And the idea here is that we take these heavenly attributes and we bring them to the earth as we grow in Jesus Christ, as we grow in his grace. Verse 5, holy is the crown, Keter, and holy is the root of the tree. Holy is the tree, holy, holy, holy. And this because the holiness on high is three. For I am king, being Jesus, and I will be king forever and ever. Now we're going to get into the Sephirot very soon, actually, in this podcast. I'm going to go through each one in its own podcast. But for now, this is saying that the highest is the crown, Keter, which is the Sephirot at the top of the tree. And Keter does mean crown in Hebrew. But holy also is the root of the tree. So from the beginning to the end, it is holy. And if you're talking about the Alpha and Omega, the beginning to the end, isn't that a name for Jesus Christ? Now, in 7, it breaks down the idea of God into a father, a mother, a son, and a spirit, a Holy Ghost. 7 says, knowledge is the heir and the father. Wisdom is the earth and the mother. Mercy is the water and the sun. Judgment, strength is fire and the Holy Ghost. Now, after Keter the crown, these are the next four Sephirot in Mormon Kabbalah. In Mormon Kabbalah, it would be Da'at, which is knowledge, which is masculine. Hakma, which is wisdom. Hesit, which is mercy. And Gevura, which is strength. And strength sometimes also is represented in judgment. So it sounds to me like what they're saying here is that in verse 5, the beginning and the end are tied together. And then after the crown are these four sephirot that represent these four elements that represent the Godhead. We have this male, this masculine, this father figure. The scriptures talk about the father a lot. And that is knowledge. Then we have the earth. And in Hebrew, the word for earth is feminine. Wisdom is feminine. When you, when you read in the Old Testament and you see trees or wisdom or earth, a lot of times it's referring to, it's like a, a hidden gem where it's referring to the divine feminine. Mercy is the water. Think of the waters of baptism, Noah's flood. Mercy is, of course, Jesus Christ, the Son. We receive God's mercy through the grace of Jesus Christ. And where does the judgment of God come from? Where do the spiritual gifts come from? That fire, the baptism of fire that is the Holy Ghost. So here we have, if three are before the creation, then knowledge and wisdom are pre-mortal. They've always existed. But mercy and strength are the beginning of the creation. And here's where it gets interesting in my mind. In verse 8, it says, And the church, she cries, where is our mother? And I want to reiterate that 
In the last podcast, I talked about this idea of the church being us. It can be us personally, but here I think it's talking about a lot of us. It's not just Israel. You have these people that have been pulled together in these organizations, and they're saying, where's the divine feminine? Where's our heavenly mother? Because it says in verse 9, and the creeds they sing, you cannot see her now. She is too holy. Let her be hidden from the eyes of her creation. So this creation belongs to her too. It's not merely the father and the son. And so we see this conflict here between the church, the people of Christ, and the creeds of the various organizations that we as Christians may belong to. And I think it's important to see that God is acknowledging this this friction. So then in verse 10, he begins to tell us about the mother. She is a woman of valor, of beauty, and she is refined in all her ways. She cannot come from the light, for the light is the sun which comes from the mother, and she illuminates the creation through her deeds. So she is this amazing woman who is glorious and perfect in every way, but she doesn't come from God. So she can't be an emanation of God in some way because the light of Christ is the sun and the sun comes from the mother. And so therefore, in any sort of hierarchy, if you will, if you, if you want to put God in some sort of hierarchy type structure, she cannot come after her son because it doesn't make sense. She should be a daughter if she comes after the son. And so because of this, I can't help but wonder, the way I was always taught, you know, growing up in the break of my church, there's this idea, but first you get a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then you get baptized, and then you receive the Holy Ghost. And so the Holy Spirit has to testify to you first before you can be baptized. And so I can't help but wonder here, if what I was always taught was correct, is that Spirit of God, that presence of God that we feel when we are first converted so that the light of Christ can be sent to us, is that the mother? And I do want to point out, I received a revelation a few years ago that explained that YHVH, Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey, the two H's or the two Hey's, the first one is the mother and the second one is the Holy Ghost. And so in this idea, they work together, the mother and the spirit, like the father and the son do. And so I think that we have always had a connection to the mother, but we've always explained it away. Or I should say the creeds of the churches have always explained it away because of their patriarchal structure. When you're in a patriarchy, I'm sure it's fine to put a mother after a father, but then to put her above the sun, in a patriarchy that still gives a woman power over a male. And so I think that the patriarchy just had to say, look, we're going to have to explain this away, throw this away, deal with this in some other way, because in a patriarchy, women can't have power. And if you give the mother, God the mother, her due, then why aren't you giving women power, and authority here upon the earth as women have it in the heavens. So it's better just to say, oh, you can't see her now, as it says in verse 9. She's too holy. Let her be hidden. Then to try to make excuses as to why the patriarchy should stay in control when there is a mother in heaven overseeing all of this. In verse 12, it says, Thus she is the very presence of Elohim. For it is she that lifts up the prayers of mankind, receiving them into her bosom. So we may be praying to the Father, but she's the one taking them in. So she hears our prayers. In verse 13, For the Father desireth to bestow, and the mother to receive. And thus in the Son may the Father bestow, and the mother receive, and thus both ends met in me, me being Jesus Christ. 
So Jesus doesn't merely represent his father. He came from the mother too. And remember, on the tree of life, mercy is under wisdom. Jesus, the son, is on the feminine side of the tree. So he does represent the father and the mother. In verse 14, Is this not the glory of God? Did I not show thee thy ministry as a garden, and behold the vastness of it? Now, I have to explain this. A long time ago, I had a dream. And in the dream, I was working in this field. And I was out, I had a, some sort of tool in my hand and, and I was tilling over the soil with it. I just kept hitting the soil over and over again, getting that soil ready to plant crops. And it was hard work. And so I looked up in my dream to see, man, how much, how much do I have to do here? And that field just seemed to go on forever. I was like, this is, if I, I, how am I going to get this done? This, this is infinite. And when I went to back up, I hit something. It was like a, a curtain of some sort, but I couldn't turn around to see it. And then I went to my right and there was something there. And again, I couldn't turn around to see it. But I suddenly realized that I was looking out from one perspective and I saw this giant field. But what I wasn't seeing was that I was backed into a corner and there was something preventing me from going backwards or side to side. I could only really move forward. And so I asked the Lord, you know, what's, what's going on here? And the Lord in the dream came to me and told me, this field represents your ministry. And I was like, man, this is a big ministry, but why am I trapped in my ministry? Why, why can't I get out of this? And he said, come and see. And so we went up into the air and looking down, I could see my ministry. And suddenly this thing that looked infinite from my perspective looked very small because we were so high up. And I realized that what I was backing into were curtains or veils that were preventing me from going into these other fields. And there were just fields forever. I was way up in the air, so high up that my field looked like a postage stamp. And yet the number of fields was just as infinite in appearance as my field was, or my field appeared to be rather, when I was standing in it. To the Lord, there is only one field, but he divides up his labor. And that we, as human beings, put up these invisible barriers. And these invisible barriers are our creeds, and they're what cause contention. But to the Lord, there is only one field. So the question becomes, why do we put these veils these curtains up, these dividers up between our ministries. Now, in one aspect, I have a friend who likes to say, stay in your lane. And I think he's right. We shouldn't be telling other people how to do whatever it is the Lord called them to do. But from another perspective, we're all actually laboring in the same field. We just don't realize it or we don't recognize it. And so in verse 15, the Lord says, And yet when I took thee up to see my creation, then did you realize how small your garden is and the breadth of all gardens? And would the water be spread throughout all the gardens that through my mercy, the mercy of Jesus Christ, knowledge and wisdom might be received? So that's what we're doing. We're trying to help the Lord by working in the gardens so that through the grace of Jesus Christ, the light of Christ can flow through us, heal the creation, and bring knowledge and wisdom, the Father and the Mother, to the world. Verse 17, that when the judgment should come, you shall not be found wanting, but understanding should open up and give unto you the crown. Now, this does touch upon the Sephirot, so I'm going to touch upon the Sephirot a little bit. Even though there's only 10 Sephirot, there's a hidden Sephirot, Bina, which rests between these four sephirot that represent the Father, the Mother, the Son, and, and the Holy Ghost. And Bina is in the middle line, and Bina is understanding. And that word in Hebrew is both male and female. And it's through that understanding that we can gain Keter, the crown, because the crown is the infinite power, the infinite knowledge, the infiniteness of God. And as finite beings, we can't be there on our own. We can only be there through Jesus Christ, and we can only understand it through the grace of Jesus Christ. 
And that grace unlocks this hidden sephirot that allows us access to everything, to the all, to the crown. Then in verse 18, For behold, the king and the queen of heaven did have a son, and the son, he had sons and daughters, begotten in the flesh as the cloam is born. Now the holem is this dot that goes above a Hebrew letter. But in Kabbalah, it is the soul. So another way of reading this would be, and the son, he had sons and daughters begotten in the flesh as the soul is born. So that soul is born within us when we're born again. And thus are all sons and daughters of the father and the mother and of the son. And thus is mercy granted by the father and the mother by way of the son. So yes, we are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ and his mercy. But the Godhead are all one God, whether you believe that in a Trinitarian sense or in a they work together as a Godhead sense. We have to understand that mercy comes to us through Jesus Christ, but it's not because he's protecting us from the father and the mother. It's because the father and mother want that mercy extended. That's why they sent their son. And so verse 21, let all they who are thirsty come for water. Let them drink from my waters, for the fountain is eternal. So what is the nature of God? It's eternal mercy. It's infinite love and righteousness. And it says to everybody, just come and drink freely. And then in verse 22, it wraps up saying, without silver or gold, come all of you and drink from the fountain of eternal mercy. Eat of the fruit of the tree of the mother. And the fruit of the tree of the mother is the son, the grace of Jesus Christ. For she is Eden. Drink and be filled. So if this revelation is, is on the nature of God, this is saying that the nature of God is mercy. The nature of God is love. The nature of God is all bestowing and never ending and eternal. And when we're born again in that mercy and that love, we are the new creation living there with the Father and Mother, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost in Eden. Now, to be clear, I think that we have to understand the idea of the parable of the garden and the true nature of God before we can get into the Sephirot. Because without that solid foundation, the Sephirot isn't going to make any sense. So, brothers and sisters, this is where I'm going to leave you this week. But I do have an assignment for you, if you will. Between now and the next podcast, if you're listening to this long after I made this, then I would recommend you just pause and not jump right to the next podcast until after you've done this. If you're listening to this and now waiting for the next podcast, I would ask that you do this while you're waiting. Go back and reread chapters 31 and 32 again. If you want to listen to the podcast again, obviously... You're more than welcome to do so, but I think you're going to get a lot more out of the Sephirot if you go back and prayerfully read these two chapters on your own and seek your own revelation to see what the Lord has to say to you about them. So until next time, Shalom and God bless.